Shea Moxon, and I represent the appellants, Gary and Kathy Fenn. Um, so did they miss anything? Did they miss anything? Um, well, you'll tell us. <laughs> they didn't get to cover everything, but uh, <laughs> there are some differences between the two cases. Obviously, we've argued a lot of the same points. Um, this case is in a different procedural posture because, first of all, the UM claim and bad faith count were pled in the original complaint together at the beginning. Um, one reason that's uh, significant is uh, Judge Morris in this case, there's absolutely no question under the case law that the original complaint could have been removed within 30 days after. Sale. That's, I, actually I was using them to warm up for you the, because uh, I knew this issue was coming and that was a difference in the case and I, and I understand your point. And I, I want to be clear, I'm speaking about removing the entire complaint. Uh, the UM count itself, uh, policy limits were 375,000. Uh, the attachments to the complaint show that there are <coughs> medical expenses of over 100,000. The $75,000 mountain controversy was easily met. So even if you look at the, you know, there are unresolved questions about whether the bad faith count would be added into the amount in controversy at the beginning when it uh, hasn't fully accrued yet, but that's not an issue here. The UM count alone was enough to take the whole case over to federal court. Uh, the bad faith count would have tagged along with it, then the federal judge would have decided whether to dismiss it or abate it. They've gone both ways on that. Um, so that's one difference. Um, the other They'd difference- They'd be arguing, here, here they were arguing they wanted dismissal. If, if that scenario worked out, they'd love the federal judge to abate bad faith claim? Uh, if they had removed? Yeah. Yes, and we've had cases before where we did exactly that. We agreed to it. We've had a case. We filed in state court, both counts together, was removed to federal court. We didn't move for remand. There's no reason to. Uh, we agreed to stay all uh, discovery on the bad faith claim because we knew we should until there was a determination of damages. Now, there's a trial set on the UM claim. This, this is a case that, you know, nobody's cited here. It's Carney versus auto owners, and there isn't any one opinion that spells this all out. There's a whole bunch of them spread out over Westlaw. Carney versus auto owners. Now, three or four months before the trial, auto owners said, we give up, here are your policy limits. That wrapped up the UM claim. We said, that's nice, we'll voluntarily dismiss that now. What happened to that trial that was set on the UM claim? It went forward anyway, because we are now determining damages as part of the bad faith count. Because, like Mr. Burlington was explaining, that pot of damages, the damages caused by the accident, are an issue in both claims, in the UM claim and the bad faith claim. Exact same pot of damages. It's a common issue. And it's usually the issue that requires the most amount of litigation. It really needs to be tried only one time. And that's what happened in this Carney versus auto, auto owners case. We had that trial. Uh, jury returned its verdict for damages. <coughs> then we proceeded to trial, uh, dis do discovery on bad faith, had another trial on bad faith. That's all there had to be. Now what's happening now, if the cases are filed sequentially, there are some federal judges who say, whatever verdict you got in your UN case doesn't count anymore. You're gonna to have to have another trial. So those, that same pot of damages is now being tried case, uh, twice in cases where they weren't pled together at the outset like we did here. That is happening uh, in the, uh, the federal King case and the Harris case. And also- but but. I acknowledge that there, <clears throat> what you said about the law and the federal courts on this issue is what you said it is. But should that factor into what we're doing here? Uh, which aspect? Because, well, because we, we can't control what the federal courts do. Oh, you know, yes, I, yes. Well, I think, yes, but that's in our favor. I, these, the, I think what that leads to is that state courts shouldn't be putting their fingers on the scale in favor of removal. They shouldn't be manipulating their procedural rulings to help defendants remove. 
That's what the trial judge did in this case. Well, see, I think these cases and this issue goes back to the complaint when it's initially filed. You filed a complaint that clearly is in COET. You cannot, you do not have the ability to advance that claim. That's rarely done in the law. It's very, very rarely done in the law. So I have a hard time understanding why in this particular area of the law are we going to carve out this exception to tolerate something that in any other proceeding, the motion to dismiss would be resoundingly well taken. Because U.M. bad faith cases are unique for two reasons. First, they're unique because that pot of damages is a common issue in both cases. Secondly, because of this problem where the verdict on the U.M. count is not being given collateral estoppel effect. Only in the federal court, though, right? Well, it could happen in state courts, too. Well, hang on, though. I mean, if it's dismissed and a separate action is brought on bad faith, how on earth is that state court decision fixing damages on the contract issue not going to be collateral estoppel on the bad faith? Because some federal judges have read. Whoa, whoa, whoa. State court I'm talking about. I respect that in federal court, which we can't control, some strange things are happening because they're just not as busy as we are and they like to create trials when they don't have to. You know, that's just a different ballgame. Okay. Okay. Because some, because state judges could be persuaded by the same ruling to do the same thing if the bad faith claim stays in state court, essentially. It's the things that the federal judges have written on this. They're not peculiarities of federal procedural law that they're basing this on. They're basing this on their reading of Florida law and saying because the insurer doesn't get full appellate review on appeal from the U.M. judgment, that's why damages have to be tried again. And that's, that could just as easily be done by any state court judge who's persuaded by that reasoning. And that is another reason why U.M. bad faith counts, claims are unique because in other situations like say, you know, legal malpractice, we know that the underlying litigation has to be concluded. These issues with, you know, claims against the insurance agent for negligently failing to procure insurance, we know the underlying coverage litigation has to be concluded first. But when that underlying litigation is concluded in those situations, it's going to be binding in a future action for malpractice. But now we have this strange situation where the judgment or the verdict from the U.M. case is not necessarily being given collateral estoppel. So if I accept your argument then, U.M. cases are different and it's okay to bring this in co-it claim at the same time you're bringing the contract action. And if the insurer, you know, moves to dismiss it for, you know, the fact that it's not ripe, that what you're saying is the court should abate that claim, not dismiss that claim. Because if you dismiss the claim, you're going to have this separate action and this fear of a different result. So now we're going to abate the claim while we force them to stand by with the two-year clock running against them. Is that fair? Well, sometimes, sometimes. Sometimes the case is removable at the outset. You're talking about the clock for removal. Right. Yes. Yes, but that's always an issue. And this isn't the only case where I've seen that, where they could have removed it at the outset, but they didn't. So then if the plaintiff drags it out to make sure the two-year clock runs, what remedy then does the insurer have that they now, through no fault of their own, have lost a removal right because you have been strategically dilatory. We don't like to use that word because you knew that clock was running. Okay. Well, there are some judges who will let them remove it anyway and say the clock doesn't start running until the bad faith count accrues. Now, I don't necessarily agree with them, but those decisions are there. In this case, this insurer didn't even attempt to take advantage of those decisions. Secondly, the removal statutes were amended a few years ago to give them a chance to argue that the one-year limit shouldn't apply because the plaintiff acted in bad faith to prevent removal. Now, that is showing that let the federal courts worry about it. Congress has already thought about that. They've cut out this exception to the time limits where they think plaintiffs are playing games too much. But we don't even have that here. In this case, we gave them a gift at the beginning. We gave them a two-for-one. They could have taken both over to federal court. They didn't. None of the conflicting cases that State Farm decided had anything to do with that question. So 
but instead they let it stay in state court, the bad faith count was abated, and then it became ripe with the arbitration award. And, and the law is clear that an arbitration award ripens a bad faith claim from the Supreme Court decisions, Imhoff, uh, and At the David time the Depot. motion for reconsideration was brought, that, that amount was already fixed. Yes, the time to yeah. ask for trial de novo had expired. At that point, entering judgment was a mere formality. It's, uh, as the case law says, it was uh, a, mystery, a ministerial act in which there's no discretion. And you've seen, I've cited cases in my reply brief where, you know, an appraisal or tendering policy limits, that'll ripen a bad faith claim or arbitration <laughs> award, even if there's some, you know, formal order entered later to uh, wrap up that count like a dismissal or partial judgment or whatever, it's actually the earlier event that establishes a valid claim that ripens a bad faith count. So by the time this came up on State Farm's uh, motion for reconsideration and to dismiss, our bad faith count was ripe under clearly established case law, including decisions of this court like Hunt, which says a judgment isn't always necessary. And counsel, because you believe it was right, your argument is that the trial court did not have the discretion to reconsider her ruling? Because my concern well, in both of these cases is that this issue of what to do with these extra contractual damages and unum cases is kind of clouding what we should be focusing on. So I want to make sure yes, I understand your that, point. That's correct, Your Honor. And that's because the VEST decision, uh, first of all, she, it, it's a minor detail, but she was reconsidering a previous judge's order, but right. it, you know, the and case law says she can do that. Right, that she could yes. or he could now, reconsider. Now, now, Vest is an interesting case. This was, um, it was decided, uh, I believe, 1990, well before the Supreme Court and Ruiz kind of endorsed the abatement. And Vest, and I know, I believe Mr. Russo has relied on this, they have a line that says, well, when you have a premature count of bad faith, you shouldn't grant summary judgment. Such claims should be dismissed. But then the very next paragraph says, um, the present action, meaning the bad faith count, has ripened and should have been allowed to proceed. Therefore, we quash the decision of the district court with direction that the plaintiff's count to be allowed to proceed. And what is that? That's exactly on point and binding here. What they're saying is that even though the count of bad faith was premature when filed, and they're saying it should have been dismissed, they didn't even consider abatement back then, because it ripened, it should have been allowed to proceed. And the Supreme Court, they quashed the first DCA's decision and they remanded with directions to allow that to happen. So that's really all the court needs to look at to decide this case. You know, as far as all the uh, judicial economy things I've argued, I, got, I stand firmly on that. But, but whichever way this court views that issue, it doesn't even get there because under VEST, once a bad faith claim was ripened, it, the court had to allow it to proceed. And I cited other cases like uh, Ann Grand v. Fox, Thomas v. Swanee County. They apply the similar principle. There was a claim that was prematurely filed but it wasn't dismissed when it was still premature. Instead, the time ran out, it became ripened. The trial court dismissed it after it ripened because, because it had been filed prematurely. In both cases, they reversed that and said, no, you can't dismiss a claim based on premature filing once it's ripened. You know, I've cited other cases that take the principle a little more broadly in my reply brief. Allied Roofing v. Venegas, Nations Bank v. Ziner, these, involve other grounds for dismissal that existed earlier in the case. But for whatever reason, the case wasn't dismissed at that point. Later on, the co trial court says, I'm reconsidering my earlier ruling, I'm dismissing based on these circumstances that existed months or years ago. In each case, the court reversed and said, no, you can't do that. Altogether, they show this principle that the power of reconsideration doesn't mean you get to turn back the clock. It's not a time machine because whatever ruling the trial court makes on reconsideration has to still be correct when it's made. And under the VEST decision, which is exactly on point, this was not a correct ruling. And I've also discussed how, uh, how this deprived us of our right 
to the forum of our choosing because once they waive their right to remove, we have our right to pick our, our uh, forum, which we chose state court and uh, the federal courts say that that actually carries more weight than the right to remove. So what the, the effect of the trial court's ruling was to give them a break after they missed every chance to remove and give them an artificial second chance. That's not proper. The federal courts don't even want that. They want their limits on removal enforced. So for these reasons, I ask you to reverse. Thank you, Mr. Moxon. You'll have uh, just shy of five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Mr. Tinker. May it please the court, Mark Tinker on behalf of State Farm. I know, uh, obviously I, I've explained the differences as far as our view between abatement and dismissal in the briefs, and I'd be more than happy to talk about that today. But I think the biggest issue is what you just uh, mentioned in your question, Judge Crenshaw, and I think we need to take a gigantic step back in this case and look at how we got here procedurally. What we have is a trial judge before entering final judgment decided to reconsider a prior ruling and dismiss rather than abate. Now in the briefs, Mr. Moxon even argued that- Can I just stop you there though? Because yes. in the unique facts of this case, if I were to go with Mr. Moxon's argument, I would say this case cried out for an abatement as opposed to a dismissal because of what subsequently occurred, and that is an arbitration that basically made this inchoate bad faith claim now fully complete inside I, the trial. I disagree with that. Okay, help one. me with that. I think this, because the situation is unique with the arbitration, I think it's probably easier to look at something that the court has likely seen before. If you look at, let's pretend this case just went to trial. There's a jury verdict, the 15 days go by, and no motion for a new trial is filed. That would be the same situation as Mr. Moxon is arguing, saying the judge has nothing to do now but enter judgment. It's just a ministerial act. But until that judgment is entered, there's no right to proceed forward with a bad faith claim. It still doesn't exist. And even beyond that, even once the judgment is entered, it's well established under Florida. Isn't that just a technical Florida. argument, though? Isn't no, that a form well, over substance argument? Under, under Florida law, even when the judgment is entered, the, the, it's established that the bad faith claim can't go forward until any appellate rights are exhausted. So even in that example, if there's no motion for new trial, the defendant could still potentially appeal. Maybe there was a discovery ruling that happened pre-trial. You didn't allow me to get this evidence, and if I had it, I think I could have got a better result at trial. So that appeal would go forward. So the bad faith claim still can't exist. This is the same situation. There's an, uh, the arbitration award is entered, but there's still no judgment on it. And in theory, State Farm could have allowed the judgment to get entered, appeal it, and say, we were denied discovery before the arbitration, and we think we could have gotten a better result, but not for that error. But under the case law, at the time the initial motion was made to dismiss count two, the bad faith claim, didn't the judge have the discretion, to, of course, to, to grant it, deny it, or to abate it? Isn't it That's, un under all the case law? Weren't those three choices available? Under, under the case law, I'm not saying I agree, but yes, under the case I, law, that's I what totally, it is. Yeah. I, I'm persuaded the case law has created a lot of confusion. I think people really don't know what to do with these things. And I think that there are some very competing issues which the case before you and that you all have, have really made clear. This is a tough call. And that's why we're trying real hard to get to the bottom of it and sort it out. But it would seem to me that the, the judge made the decision at that time to abate the action. So then at the motion for reconsideration, which is, again, very discretionary, and what the judge did on the front end was consistent with, le with at least some case law that's out there. So it seems that I, what, what, what was different in this case that would change a judge's mind, which with the unique facts of this case, that we now have an arbitration award that establishes bad faith, or at least certainly makes a bad faith case pretty strong. I'm not sure that we have anything on the record to say what changed this judge's mind, but as far as for this court's purposes today, what you just mentioned, those are both very discretionary rulings. And uh, what this court wrote in King, although it's been argued it was dicta, but it was an en banc decision, every member of this panel signed off on it and wrote, we think the preferred method is dismissal. So now they're asking you to say that no reasonable trial judge could have reconsidered and decided that the preferred method was dismissal. Yeah. And I think that's where this case just kind of runs into its, I said, like I said at the outset, I know the issue is interesting, but procedurally where we stand right now, 
the judge made a discretionary decision. I don't think it can be said that no reasonable trial judge could have done what and she did. And I guess on the existing case law, it's hard to refute that argument because there's, there's enough, there's law out there that would support anything this judge would do on this issue. I agree, and that's, I think that's my major point. Like I said, I'd be more than happy to talk about the merits of dismissal versus abatement. I don't think that even gets at issue in this particular case. Uh, but to the extent the court has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, you know, while you're here only about your case, this issue is bigger than your case. I agree. And you've listened to the two very fine lawyers before you make very good arguments, and you've listened to Mr. Moxon. You might as well give us your best shot on the larger issue, you know, maybe that beyond your case, because the real problem that all these trial judges have when they get these cases, they have these com bad faith actions that are brought, that are in co-it, they're worried about the removal rights of the insurer, sure, but at the same time, they're worried about d duplicative efforts, inconsistent results, judicial economy. Help us figure this thing out. I think one of the biggest issues that I see, and it goes to the removal, and I know it's a question that you asked Mr. Moxon and you asked in the prior case, is, well, aren't some of these cases removable at the outset? And the answer to that is not necessarily. And even in this one, where we've got UM policy limits above the $75,000 threshold, they're 350, I believe, or 375 was available here, that's not necessarily a move, removable right away because the federal courts, some judges look at it and say, it's not just about the policy limits. You have to prove to us, you know, you can have a million dollars in available limits, but you have to prove to us that the amount in controversy in this particular case gets above 75. Now what counsel has pointed to, and the only thing that's in this record, is the civil remedy notice had some attached medical bills. Well, some federal judges say, yes, but that civil remedy notice relates to a bad faith claim that is in co-it. That's not an issue, so we can't look at that. Other judges say we can, and that's where a defendant can run into trouble, is they could try to remove it at the beginning of the case when it's first filed, run into a judge who says, I can't look at that, you can't remove it now, get remanded. There is no right of appeal from an order of remand, so they just have to accept that ruling. Get to the end of the case, now a bad faith claim is ripe, it's being presented, try and remove it again, and this time get assigned to a different judge, and that judge is one who happens to believe you should have done it at the beginning, you already had the ability, get remanded again, no right of appeal. So they can run into basically a, a catch-22 situation where there's nothing they can but do. It, it seems they have to err on the side of removal or else they lose it. Well, that's, I can tell you from a practical matter, that's not, oh, as far as what the, but the, what the client should do? Yeah, but. That puts us in a position of, of, of analyzing your case and their case based on what may or may not be a sound federal practice, which is something that, frankly, is not my problem. I agree, and I think right? what, so what you go back to is what Judge Davis has mentioned, is there is no other context where a completely inchoate cause of action can be pled and just thrown into a lawsuit, and it may or may not ever become a viable cause of action, but just throw it in there and leave it there anyway. And it, the issue with the federal removal is pointing out that what this does is it takes a non-existent cause of action and causes problems for your opponent. And it would be no different than, in this case, if Fenn sued State Farm and John Doe, a Florida resident, waited a couple years and then dismissed John Doe. Now, they just defeated removal, defeated uh, diversity jurisdiction based upon something that didn't exist. It, it may never exist. We may never find out that there was a John Doe but that was involved. But you can fix that. <laughs> Conceivably, you can fix that at the front end. Well, like the way to fix that, that is through uh, what Mr. Moxon mentioned, is that you can prove that there was fraud or bad faith to prevent removal. But that shouldn't be something where they can take a non-existent cause of action, put it in the lawsuit, and put the burden on State Farm to now, after the fact, go back and prove that this was incorrect and that it prevented the right to remove. So I think, you know, it, it just goes back to this court, and I'm going to miss the case name because I'm horrible with names. It was a Shuck versus Bank of, Bank of America case where the court explained the difference between dismissal and abatement. It said if there's a, a, a cause of action that's just premature, it will vest at some point in the future. We just have to wait the passage of time, then abate it, wait for the passage of time, and now it's viable, it's there. However, a, case, a claim that's non-existent, it may or may not ever come into existence, 
that's something that should be dismissed because there's no reason to clog the court's dockets to put these non-existent claims in and let, if we don't know if they're ever going to accrue. And I think kind of an, an extreme example I gave in the briefs is when Mr. Fenn goes out and he buys his uninsured motorist policy, he can't immediately file an uninsured motorist claim and say, just debate that because I may or may not get in an accident someday and need coverage. It's non-existent. That would, there would be no problem dismissing that, that claim. It would happen 100 times out of 100. This is no different. He's filing a bad faith claim that may or may not ever exist. We don't know when he files it. It's non-existent. It should be dismissed. And that's just under established precedent from this court in Shuck. It doesn't have anything to do with federal jurisdiction. It's just a legal principle of this is a non-existent claim. You can't plead things that don't exist. I think that's it, unless the court has any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Tinker. Thank you. Mr. Moxon. I'll give you five minutes for rebuttal. Mr. Moxon, would no reasonable trial judge have done what this judge did? Uh, well, absolutely. It's error as a matter of law under vest. This was not a discretionary ruling. There has to be some reason to dismiss a case. And just asking the question, well, was there any legal basis to do it? There wasn't. And well, except for the cases it, all say that when one of these claims are filed, you can either abate or dismiss, and until the judgment is rendered pursuant to the um, arbitration proceedings, it is still an inchoate claim. I, Your Honor, I disagree on that last Help part. Me with that. There are no cases that say a judgment has to be rendered after an arbitration or an appraisal or a confession of policy limits for it to become right. And that is where I believe State Farm has seriously misconstrued the case law. In the Hunt case, uh, there was an appraisal award. Then after the appraisal award, um, the plaintiff voluntarily dismissed their uh, underlying claim. Did the court say that the, claim, the bad faith claim became ripe when the voluntary dismissal was filed? No, it became ripe with the appraisal award. The Trafalgar case. Another appraisal case. Uh, after the appraisal award, the insurer paid its policy limits and summary judgment was entered on the, uh, on the insurance claim. Did the summary judgment ripen the bad faith claim? No, it was the appraisal award. You look at cases like, uh, uh, well, Vest is a good example. That was a case where the count for UM benefits and the bad faith count were both pled in the original complaint. It's not as clear in the Supreme Court's opinion, but it's spelled out in the lower opinion from the first DCA. Two counts, UM and bad faith. The Supreme Court said, in that case, the bad faith count was premature when it was filed, but it became ripe when the trial court approved a settlement between the insured and the uninsured tortfeasor which I found was interesting. Now, the, the insurance company paid its limits shortly after that settlement. Why didn't they say it became ripe when they paid their limits? I don't know, but they said it became ripe when the trial court approved the settlement between the, the, the insured and the tortfeasor. Now, what happened to the UM count after that? The court didn't even say, but what they did not say is that some judgment had to be entered or some dismissal, some kind of final order entered on the UM count to wrap it up. What the case law looks, when you put it all together, and I go through this in my reply brief, the case law takes a pragmatic look at this. They look at, is there really anything left to litigate, or has it been established that the insured had a valid claim for insurance benefits? And when these appraisal situations, I disagree with Mr. Tinker that it's anything like when a final judgment's entered and the, and the insurance company still might appeal. Once an appraisal award becomes final, there, isn't, there are very limited grounds that can be appealed after that. It's, but the, you know, the amount of the, the uh, excuse me, arbitration, you know, like uh, Johnson v. Levine says, once the time to ask for trial de novo expires, it becomes final and binding. And that's also a case that says that entering it is the judgment afterwards is a mere ministerial act. And you know, we also have to consider State Farm didn't appeal from the judgment. So they're talking about, you know, it's all speculation. They're talking you know, about castles in the clouds that don't exist. Once this uh, arbitration war was entered and the 20 days expired, it was a done deal that they owed their policy limits. And under the case law, that is all that is necessary 
for a count of bad faith to become ripe. And under vest, once it became ripe, no matter what you think about the other decisions, uh, issues that we discussed, the trial court had no choice but to allow it to proceed. And that's a question of law. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Moxon. Thank you. Good argument. Thank you both. Our next case is Parham versus DeVees.